And here we have it. Several different Dean Drag vortexes simply by just changing the fluid properties. You may have heard of inertia microfluidic applications which operate with just flow. There is no external stimulus like an electric field or magnetic field, only the flow driving the application. One application where inertia has been studied thoroughly has been particle separation. Building a device that can separate particles or sounds with flow means that solutions may not need to be tuned to an electric field or require external factors such as magnetic nanoparticles. This means you can have a controlled system without any external interference, which is important in sampling. External interference can foul the solution, adding impurities which, depending on the application, can be very bad. One example is the recent postdoctorate I worked on. We wanted to create a wearable device which would separate a particular cell type from whole blood. We didn't want to add any contaminants as we wanted a closed system. Adding contaminants and fouling the solution would have meant excessive cleaning steps which can be easily avoided if we used inertia microfluidics among other indirect manipulation. So there are many inertia particle separation devices in the literature. There are spiral devices, micro cylinders like coin pushing machines, and box cascades that pinch flow. Each of these devices can be tailored to separate particles into distinct subpopulations based on size and density. This is done by studying the forces acting upon the particles. In the case of curved microchannels, Dean drag forces. Briefly, the particle separation occurs by the strength of the lift and drag forces acting upon the cells and or particles which are formed by two vortexes in the channel. Controlling the lift and drag can provide precise particle separation. A simple calculation can be done producing the Dean number. The Dean number indicates whether the vortexes will form in the secondary flow perpendicular to bulk flow and the stability of said vortexes. Essentially, values between 75 to 200 should produce stable vortexes. However, in microfluidics at the microscale, the Dean number range changes between 0 to 30 for stable vortexes. The Dean number is an indicator of Reynolds number, flow, which we explored before. This is then times by the square root of the solvers. characteristic linear length, which is the hydraulic diameter, divided by 2 times the radius of curvature. The Dean number will decrease in spiral microfluidic devices due to the increasing radius of curvature. The full effect of vortexes on particles will be understood with Lagrangian particle tracking, which we will explore in part two. In this example, we are focusing on a curved microchannel with a fixed radius of curvature. To calculate the Dean's number, we need to first calculate the Reynolds number, which is 4.55, and adding the additional terms for Dean number, we achieve a value of 0.77. The Dean's number would become smaller if this was a spiral expanding outwards. So how do we model flow? The same way we did in understanding Navier-Stokes solvers. Yep. That's right, there's nothing additional we need to do at this moment in time to model particles in flow. So the Navier-Stokes we have explored before with fluid, dynamic viscosity, density and velocity which are all required. To simplify the model, which you'll understand why later, we are going to look at a section of the microfluidic spiral separation device. This is a curved microchannel which is 200 microns tall by 500 microns wide. The 3D microchannel was designed in Autodesk Inventor whilst I was at the University of Kent. In the exact same way we label domains in 2D with the previous video on droplet formation, we will use Gmesh once again to select the boundaries and produce boundary labels. There will be a how-to video on labelling, but essentially instead of labelling the lines like we did in droplet formation, we will be labelling the faces due to the 3D nature of this model and mesh. Additionally, the mesh cell size can be tailored by setting the minimum and maximum cell size in the settings menu of Gmesh. 
Again, this is all explained in depth on the GitHub Wiki, as well as in an upcoming video soon. So make sure you subscribe for that. So having labeled our boundaries, we must set the boundaries in code as well as the parameters for our simulation. The fluid settings are going to be 21 degrees water. As the simulation is at the micro scale and laminar, we could use the steady solver for this problem. However, we might want to use the Turing method as it scales to larger mesh problems. Essentially, the mesh can overload the direct solver and I haven't found a good iterative steady Navier-Stokes solver to implement into Fenix yet and Bernie's. Uh, so this is work in progress. So let's review the result. And yep, it, this is very similar to flow around the cylinder, but without the cylinder at the micro scale, so laminar flow. That makes sense as this is a simple Navier-Stokes solution. So let's make a cross-section cut to see if there is any secondary flow. Ah, right. There is only the dominant flow towards the cross-section. So we need to minimize this y-axis vector so we can view the xz cross-sectional vectors, the secondary flow. We can do this easily in PowerView by selecting the surface vector field from the drop-down menu whilst we have highlighted the cross-section filter. However, we still see a major bias towards one direction. Interestingly, the way the flow is heading. Well, actually that makes a lot of sense. Simply, if you remove the dominant force, you'll be left with the x axis cross-section secondary flow, which is exactly what we want. But what we are viewing here is the cross-sectional vectors towards the middle of the curved microchannel, because we're not dead in this middle, we're not dead in the center. So we need to find the place on our microchannel where we can minimize this vector bias. Well, that'll be the middle of the channel in relation to this plane. This can be incredibly fiddly to find. In theory, we can use the ruler command, measure the minimum and maximum points of the mesh in the plane, and calculate the middle point. However, it can still be really tricky. So minor adjustments near the middle, and finally, we should have something like this. Here we can see flow vortexes at the top and bottom of the channel. This is very important. This is our Dean drag forces, and this is how we lift and drag particles for separation. So one additional test we can do is increasing and decreasing the velocity in our simulation to see whether the Dean drag forces change, either the shape of the vortex, vortexes or the size of the vortexes. So I set the velocity 10 times slower and reran the solution. Interestingly, there were vortexes, but they were lacking the vector strength. Obviously, as we decrease the velocity vector, as well as the vortexes appearing unstable, this makes sense due to decreasing the Reynolds and therefore decreasing the Dean's number. To test whether the instability was due to flow velocity or the Reynolds and Dean number in general, I investigated increasing the fluid viscosity and well, it looked very similar to decreasing the velocity. So much so, I felt I had to show both on screen to prove there are slight differences in the stability. Here we see similarities, but the velocity magnitude is an order smaller in the decreased velocity. Again, this shows instabilities in the secondary flow, likely due to the low Reynolds and Dean number. Next, I increased the Reynolds number slightly by increasing the fluid density. The increase in Reynolds number will increase the Dean number, as shown, the model had very stable vortexes, which appeared to migrate to the left-hand corner and the bottom right-hand corner. This could be due to the increase in density or the geometry of the channel where further tests are required. The migration of the vortexes could signify the presence of secondary vortexes to the vortexes already in the channel. Within this model, there appeared to be a good relationship between Reynolds and Dean number with stability of the vortexes within the curved microchannel. Further tests are required to define the upper Dean limit 
likely a D number around 30 according to the literature, where the lower D number is likely 0.2 for this model. The lower limit will change depending on the model due to the geometry of the channel affecting the hydraulic diameter as well as the radius of curvature in the D number equation. Also, we may be able to build tolerances into our model where separation can be carried out over a velocity range and still select our desired subpopulation of particles or cells. So to conclude, we've shown that Bernays can be used for modeling Dean drag forces. This is great if we want to calculate how our particles will be separated and as a proof for the next step of our simulation, which is simulating particle separation around a spiral microfluidic device. Centering the mesh model would have made it easier to find the cross-sectional vectors. Otherwise, it is very difficult to find on a curved or spiral microfluidic device. Interestingly, there were vortexes in all the solutions, but differed greatly in the stability and the velocity strength. In this model, I showed that a minimum D number between 0.2 to 0.7 is required to form a stable vortex where the upper limit is likely near a D number of 30 based on the literature for curved microfluidic devices. This is quite important when we consider our particle separation, which is dependent on these lift and drag forces. So next video, we'll look at how to simulate particles based on their size and density a type of particle tracking called Lagrangian particle tracking. Thanks for watching and see you next time.